Good evening, everyone. My name is Kim Dorman, and I serve as the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Princeton Public Library. And it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's program, Richard Ryan's presentation about his book, American Urbanist, How William H. White's Unconventional Wisdom Reshaped Public Life. I want to start by thanking all of you for joining us, both in person in our community room and virtually on Zoom. Tonight's hybrid event will run for about an hour in total, and there will be an opportunity for audience members, both in person and virtually, to ask questions. We have someone on the live stream monitoring the chat for questions, and for those who are here in person, simply raise your hand and you will be handed a microphone. Just a few housekeeping notes I'd like to quickly mention. This room is T-Coil enabled, so if you have a T-Coil enabled device, please feel welcome to switch them on at this time. If you don't have a T-Coil enabled device but would like to use one of our headsets, we have some available on the uh, piano at the side of the room. To make sure the system works, any, everyone who is speaking needs to use a microphone. The library asks that everyone who comes into the building wear a mask for the duration of their stay, unless they are using the cafe. At tonight's event, the library is permitting speakers to remove their masks when they are on stage. To make sure that everyone feels safe, we have placed the audience beyond the CDC recommended distance. It is now my pleasure to introduce Richard K. Ryan, well known in Princeton and beyond. He was for many years the editor of the US One newspaper and now edits the digital news site, Tap Into Princeton Community News. Rich Ryan is also the author of American Urbanist, how William H. White's unconventional wisdom reshaped public life. Today is particularly special as it is the official publication day for the book, and the book has just received a rather glowing review by Alexandra Jacobs in the New York Times, where she invites you to swap out the power broker, that ostentatious Zoom accessory, for this elegant counterweight. I've heard a rumor that the book is sold out in many places, and so I'm delighted that Labyrinth has saved some copies for us, which you can purchase this evening for $35. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Richard Ryan. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, uh, Becky, and the IT staff here at the library, and thank the entire Princeton Public Library for making this event, uh, event possible. Now, wonderful introduction to me, but I just like to Take one minute, half a minute, to get to know my audience just a little better. And I have one question. I think I know this audience because I'm seeing some familiar faces. But I am curious um, about one thing. And I wonder how many people live in a single family house. And I'm looking, I'm seeing most people raising their hands. Um, and that's good news in a way because it does reflect the fact that Princeton is a suburban community, have a suburban style audience. and. Uh, William H. White would welcome that because a lot of what he had to say about urban design uh, also applies very well uh, to the suburban setting, and we'll get into that later. Um, so now in that suburban home you have, I'll bet most of you have a door that looks out on the front street. Um, often it's in the middle of the house. Maybe a few people have it off to a corner, one corner or another, but I'll bet almost nobody has a house where there are two doors right at the corner. One that leads, points out to the street, and another one that goes to the side yard. That is an unusual, very, very odd thing. And if your architect came with that kind of thing in mind, you'd probably say, that's crazy. It's going to waste too much interior space. I can walk out one door or another and walk five feet around the corner to get to that other part of the house. As odd as it is, it turns out we do have one such building, prominent building, in Princeton. And it turns out to be a very successful building, in part because of that. <laughs> ah. And there it is. It's, it may be recognizable to some of you in the audience. This is, uh, and for those of you on Zoom, this is, in fact, is the building in which we are now located. This is the public library. And as you see, one of those doors uh, looks out on the street. The one on the left, as you look at it, looks out on Witherspoon Street. The other one on the right looks into Heinz Plaza. And it is the fact that it um, goes out in both directions is really instrumental in the success of Heinz Plaza. Uh, if you can imagine the, the only one entrance and we're down in the middle of the block off to the left in that picture, uh, it wouldn't give the same energy to Heinz Plaza, and Heinz Plaza in turn wouldn't give the same energy uh, back to the library. But it does, and Heinz Plaza um, has become um, a wonderful um, outdoor event for um, outdoor assemblies, for outdoor dining. We'll see uh, 
uh, some protest groups. We see some counter protests every once in a while. And of course, in the lower left, there's some uh, shameless self promotion by some <laughs> author. Um, wouldn't you know it? Well, by the time Heinz Plaza was built, I already knew just a little bit about William H. White. Uh, because back in the 1970s, I had read a book of his called The Last Landscape. And in that book, he talked about various ingenious ways uh, to thwart urban sprawl and preserve open space. And people were very worried about the, the demise of open space at that time. The suburbs, the, the, the new interstate highways were just pushing everybody out into the open land. But White said that you didn't just have to wait around for some rich guy to give you millions of, of dollars, um, although that was always appreciated. <laughs> he said that there were really lots of other ways that you could save open space. And one of the best ways to save open space was to put, make better use of the land that you had in the urban landscape. Because if you could make better use of the land in the urban space, people wouldn't be so quick to run out into the, into the uh, exurbs. Um, so for one example, he would recommend taking an abandoned or underutilized uh, plot of land and putting it to a higher use. And there was one example back then, up until about 2017, right in the heart of Princeton, just about a block or so away from here, and that's Dome Alley. And Dome Alley was then uh, just a little alleyway that went from uh, uh, Nassau Street between the Starbucks and then Landau's store down to a small um, parking lot, uh, some dumpsters that serve various buildings, the back of a couple of restaurants and so on and some loading docks and back entrances into retail stores. Um, nothing much. But one day in the summer of 2017, I walked by Dome, Dome Alley, and I saw that there were some arts and crafts people in town that were starting to transform that little pathway um, into an exhibit space. And I thought, aha. Uh -huh. and, and so I went up to one of the organizers, of it, an architect and a, and a builder here in town named Kevin Wilkes. And I mentioned to him, I said, Kevin, and I was thinking back to the last landscape that I read. I said, Kevin, what you're doing is really right out of the William H. White playbook. And at that point, I thought I would have to explain to Kevin who William H. White was, mention the last landscape, and so on. But Kevin immediately responded. He said, oh, Holly White. Holly White is my hero. Yeah. And for a split second, I didn't know, know who this woman Holly was. Um, it took me a minute or two to realize <laughs> that Holly was the, the nickname and, and the name to family and friends uh, for William H. White. H stands for Hollingsworth. Um, but I caught on to the, to, the, to the nickname right away, and I also said, hmm, maybe it's time to look more deeply into the life of William H. White. So as Bill Malley uh, soon took shape, um, and uh, it became, up in the upper left, an artist, an artist space, a photographer had an exhibit up there. She's giving a talk now about her exhibit. The Arts Council put on a Day of the Dead uh, exhibit. Somebody's taking a picture in front of that. Uh, on the lower left, um, uh, a, a wonderful young urbanist named Emma Brigo uh, designed a winter, winter wonderland exhibit, she called last winter. And people came in there and took, took pictures left and right. And of course, again, uh, shameless self-promotion by, uh, by our author. Um, so, as Dome Alley was all taking shape, I was going through, um, going through its various iterations above. Um, I was digging into the white story, and I soon soon realized that there were two sides to the to the white coin, and I'd like to address both of them tonight, and uh, um, hope that you gain a greater understanding of the man and, and both of those sides. The first side was his contribution to our understanding of the physical realm. Places like Heinz Plaza, which I showed before, and the potential of a place like Dome Alley. Um, and, and also the, the tools that he provided to us to enable us to participate in the planning process in our own hometown, recognize underutilized spaces that we might put to better use for the, whole, for the good of the whole public. Um, things that would be very valuable, incidentally, during something like the COVID pandemic. Um, and what we now call um, the placemaking movement. And this placemaking movement can, can be traced back directly to white. But there's another side of the white coin 
Um, and that's the, 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 the side that developed in the first half of, of White's career. Um, that's when White identified the perils of groupthink, he coined the word groupthink, and also the sort of the acquiescent conformity that he associated with the organization. This is when he wrote his mega bestseller um, called The Organization Man, published in 1956, and going on to sell uh, millions of copies. Um, so he, he criticized the conformity of the, of the organization man, but he also realized um, that an organization man, in the best sense, would be one uh, who could resist the organization. He knew there were times when he really should resist the organization. He, the organization man, um, White believed, could, would be able to rock the boat without capsizing the boat. Um, and, and certainly this belief and this, this uh, understanding of this tension made White an even more effective urbanist later on in his career. And it turns out to me that, that, that both sides are related. Uh, both sides focus on the individual uh, in relation to the surrounding context. Uh, on the one side of the coin is the physical surroundings um, that we are part of. And on the other side of the coin, it's the social and, and uh, organizational environment in which we inhabit. So my goal here tonight is that you will walk out of here with an appreciation for White, both for his social criticism and also for his work in urban design. But first, I'd like to provide some, some biographical details. There you go. This is a, a White as a, as a uh, high school senior at St. Andrews School in Delaware. And when I started research on the book, uh, man in town, Scott Soprell was chairman of the trustees, I believe, of, of um, St. Andrews. He was a graduate of St. Andrews. And he went there because his parents had the very bright idea that he should go there and get a, a decent education. His parents are right here in the room. Scott and uh, Linda and Dudley Soprell. There they are. Thank you. And so, um, so Scott opened the door to me at uh, St. Andrews, and uh, they have wonderful archives. And um, that this was right at the beginning of the school. Um, uh, Holly graduated 10th in his class. That was the good news. Uh, the bad news is there were only 12 kids in the class. <laughs> uh, and so um, this is pretty much the whole senior class. And so White, is, but his headmaster, his headmaster knew something about the guy. He was, the headmaster of the school was an amazing guy who really took time to understand each and every student. White is an unusually brilliant boy whose temperament is such that he can scarcely be classified in the ordinary way. And th 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 this, uh, th th this description of White, I think, carries, carries through to, to, throughout his entire life. Um, so then, based on that wonderful, uh, not on his class rank, but the wonderful recommendation of my headmaster, he goes off to Princeton, Freshman year on the, on the left, senior year on the, on, on the right, class of 1939. And you think, well, a um, guy like this probably head off to Yale Law School, maybe Harvard, business school, perhaps, who knows what. Uh, instead, he ends up selling Vicks Vapor Rub. This is 1939, the end of the Depression. The job he gets is a salesman for Vicks Vapor Rub in a territory in eastern Kentucky. Wow. And, um, Selling Vicks to Hicks is, <laughs> is basically what's going on. Um, but uh, with that background, it may be easier to understand why he eagerly enlisted in the Marine Corps, even before Pearl Harbor, several months before Pearl Harbor, he jumped into the Marines. And the Marines were the first uh, three phases in White's uh, in professional growth. Um, they, they roughly correspond to the, the decades, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. And in each of those decades, as I looked at his, at his life, I came to a totally new understanding of those decades. I, I did not view any of them um, in, the same, in the same way when I first started research. So at the Marines in 1940, we discovered that military intelligence was not an oxymoron and not a joke that uh, George Carlin used to crack uh, with me and all, many of his routines. 
military intelligence, Green Ice and Water. Um, the truth was that um, in the Marines, they took military intelligence, they took the uh, art and science of, of the military very seriously. Um, Holly uh, went off to Guadalcanal. Um, it, it was no joke. It was not just uh, pen and paper exercises here. This is the real deal. Holly's in the uh, standing and the up in the right uh, with a mustache. And uh, he, uh, he, was, he definitely was in direct combat. Uh, he, he killed at least one, uh, at least one Japanese soldier. He wrote a series of letters to his parents uh, that were all archived by St. Andrew's School and collected the letters of various students who had run off to war. And uh, so you get a real time appreciation of what life is going through. And um, he um, caught malaria after Guadalcanal. He got he was stationed in Australia for a while, finally sent back to the States. And he became an instructor at the Marine Corps uh, Training Center in Quantico, uh, uh, and also began writing for the Marine Corps Gazette, a very serious um, military journal. Um, and, and Holly wrote articles on uh, uh, how to transform information into intelligence. He, he wrote about the history of uh, intelligence gathering through different um, different military campaigns. What about the, the capabilities of the Japanese? Um, amazing amounts of research that, that the Marines brought to bear on their effort in, uh, in the Pacific theater. He even began to see some of the tensions between the conscientious member of the organization and the organization itself. And in 1946, he was invited to be the commencement speaker at St. Andrews, probably the first alumnus to come back and speak to the graduating class. Um, he was just 28 years old, but he related a story of a particular Marine Corps comrade who, who, had, who had been killed at Guadalcanal. Um, he, was a soldier, he was a soldier named Kirby Taylor. And Kirby, um, White described at the time, um, had been gung-ho, too gung-ho, even by Marine standards. Now, um, that's, that's saying something. The total stickler for detail. The other guys appeared to hate him because they, they made him march, march again, get it right, leave it right, stay late, march all night if they had to. And the nickname for him was Ramrod. And, and yet Taylor held through and then he ended up um, and did one heroic mission that survived. He went out two days later and tried to duplicate it in a sense. He got trapped. He sent his guys back. Um, he got killed. And, and, and how I describe him this way to the, to the, to the kids from St. Andrews. Keller had the complete courage of his convictions. He had known that group disapproval was more apparent than real. That where men collectively scoffed, they might, as individuals, be filled with unexpressed respect. This is a theme that Holly pursued into the 1950s. It's really um, the first glimmer of the organization man, uh, and, it, and it's that first side of the, the coin. So from um, the Greens, armed with those clippings from the Green Corps Gazette, at least some of these articles were three, four, five thousand words long. The average journalist declined a fortune, didn't have such a substantial um, personal clippings, I'm sure. How they got hired at of Fortune magazine. Now, I'm a product of the 60s, the protest era, so I never really thought too much about the 50s, but I figured, you know, that was the lost generation of men in gray flannel suits, stay at home moms, the silent generation, all good, uh, all good descriptors, I thought. But I quickly discovered there were undercurrents of innovation and invention going on. And one prime example was Fortune magazine. Fortune was doing uh, cutting edge journalism that uh, uh, most uh, most journals today, most media today would be would be afraid would not would not have the money to take on. Uh, these guys were not afraid to to go after anybody and even bite the hand that fed them. Uh, the, the American uh, uh, was American Advertising Council sponsored a uh, incredibly uh, 
elaborate publicity campaign called the Free Enterprise Campaign. And they're basically trying to say that this uh, all this kind of uh, Harry Truman stuff and all the rest is uh, just leading us to the path down socialism. And it was uh, terrible stuff. Howie wrote an, started out writing an article about it in which he described the whole thing and then said, frankly, it's not worth a damn um, for what they were doing. And then in the course of that reporting, he came across the concept of, of groupthink, where he, he enunciated the concept of groupthink. So this was his a snippet of his definition um, of this term. Rationalized conform open articulate philosophy, which holds that group values are not only expedient, but right and good as well. And it's that, I think it's that right and good as well that still pervades our thinking. How many times have we gone into a group, we have a meeting, we fight, we come through whatever, and we have a consensus and it just feels right, it just feels better. Um, it may be better in feeling and all the rest, but is it necessarily the better decision? That's another question. And the best decision might be the one in which there were three or four people dissenting to no end. Um, or it may be that the dissenting group had the best decision. Uh, sometimes we'll never know, but it's always comforting to think that you're doing right and good, uh, even though it may not necessarily be the best course of action. So White saw some unintended consequences in this quest for harmony. Um, and the organization, um, as he says, that the uh, uh, we're denying that there should be a conflict between the individual and the organization. But the de denial is bad for the organization and even worse for the individual. And um, White was looking out for those individuals. He, he, he worried about the individual who might be the, the genius who also was antisocial. Um, at that point, corporations began using personality tests in their hiring process. Uh, in the organization, man, White actually prints some of these tests. He even gives a little guide as how you should best answer them <laughs> to, uh, to minimize your, uh, your chance of getting pushed out because you're a little bit high. But he worried about the unorthodox thinker. He, he, he worried about the oddball. Now, speaking of oddballs, and another question to the audience. Anybody in the room back in the pre-COVID days when you commuted to work? Anybody commute to work by bicycle? One, two, three, four. Okay. Did, did anybody ever think you were a little odd riding by bike? Or was it, uh, it was okay? 2020, 2018, it's pretty much okay to come, come by bike. But in the 1950s, um, there's a there's a lady slogging up Sixth Avenue or something going from Bowers Greenwich Village up toward Rockefeller Center. Um, this was a little odd. Like, why is she on a bicycle? Can't she afford the subway? Um, you no. Know, and people took note of this particular lady um, as a uh, as a little bit of an odd duck because there is. Are we able to see this? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, this is Jane Jacobs, and and uh, Jane rode a bicycle to work. Yeah. I tried to find a picture of her smoking a pipe at work. There are references to her smoking a pipe. So she was a little bit out of kilter. But I, I think um, today um, some people might not appreciate other real obstacles that Jane faced um, in her in the early days of her career. Both architecture and journalism were, were still a man's world. And Jane um, had come down from Scranton, Pennsylvania, um, on a uh, worker in New York, doing editorial work and so on, got married, had kids, but was a working mother. She worked at Architectural Forum, which was a Time Life publication, in the same building with Fortune. And um, when, when um, the, the managing editor of Architectural Forum was invited to this very prestigious conference at Harvard. For some reason, he didn't want to go. So he said, well, who can I get to go? He tried a couple of his, his colleagues, the men. Uh, they didn't want to go either. And he thought, well, what about, maybe we can get it for Jane. Maybe Jane will go. So this is the way he pitched the letter to the organizers at Harvard. This is the way he presented 
uh, the idea that, that Jane Jacobs might go up there and give a presentation. This is his letter. If another woman were not out of place, he said that because there's already one woman, there's one rare woman architect at Harvard. Uh, so if another one would not be out of place, might I suggest Mrs. Robert Jacobs? So right away, he lets you know she's not a single one. No, he wouldn't do that to her. Uh, that's that's too too wild. Mrs. Robert Jacobs, or you can call her Jane Jacobs. So she went, she made quite a splash. And um, when she came back, um, Holly immediately commissioned her to write uh, an article for Fortune, which um, downtown is for people. It went into a book published in 1958 called The Exploding Metropolis, um, one of the chapters. Holly edited it. And when that book came out and the article came out, um, the Rockefeller brothers it ca caught the attention of the Rockefeller brothers. And they said, we need somebody to write an article that sort of talks about the urban environment, gets it out of the pure planner's realm. And here's a layperson who might be able to do it. So, so Holly encouraged her to uh, pursue the book. Um, other people did as well. Um, she, was, she still had the kids, still had the husband. He was an architect, but not making that much money. She would quit her day job, but she needed a grant. So Holly, um, Holly wrote to, the, to these Rockefeller guys um, and said, um, said she, he needed the, she needed the money he was vouching for. He said, I believe the result of this research, this writing may prove to be one of the great contributions to the whole field of urban planning and design. She got $10,000, not $85,000 in today's uh, value. Um, I can assure you writers don't get that much in the <laughs> so, so that was good. Um, then there was a little problem. She, she ran, she didn't get the job done. So she said, oh gosh, I, I'm way, this project's turning into a whole lot more than I ever dreamed. Um, I need more time and I need more money. And so she went back to Holly to vouch for her again. And, and Holly was in, in typical fashion, instead of looking at this and presenting it as a problem, he says to the Rockefeller guys, this is really good news. This is not a problem, this is good news. <laughs> Quite frankly, I am happy to hear that she wants to spend more time on the book. I wholeheartedly recommend the additional assistance for the extra time she wants to do the book. I believe a great and influential book is in the making. And Jane got another $8,000. And that carried, that carried her through to um, the publication of The Death and Life of Great American Cities, which is number one on the, uh, the all-time urban It's just over and over and over again, the top, top 100 urbanists, top 100 urban books. Um, it's, it's number one or very, very close. So by now we're in the, this, that came out in 1961. By now we're in the 1960s. So, um, so I know all about the 1960s. I, I was a product of the 1960s. I grew up in that, in that era. And we think of the 1960s, this is a time when all the baby boomers hit college, who were ready to take on the world, were ready to change the world, to link up with the uh, anti-war protesters. Vietnam War is heating up. Um, the Black Power Movement is happening. We tie in with them. Um, we go on and we take on the establishment. Um, in fact, my memory wasn't quite right. So we've got a protest here, but as Ada Louise Huxtable, the architectural critic of the New York Times, writes, don't write off the revolution because it's being made by men in business suits. And um, so in 1969, we have a couple of guys in coats and ties. And so the guy on the left, the college senior, he's the guy that like, should be the big activist, the big, the big agent of change. We have Holly White in the middle. We have Robert Gomey, president of Princeton, with the bow tie. He's, this is, these guys are the establishment that are trying to fend off the, um, the revolution. Well, in fact, the guy on the left, wrote about things, he didn't get much done. Um, the guy on the right, Robert Goheen, number one, opened the door at Princeton for the, uh, 
for the transformation of the eating cup system. Selective eating cones suddenly he opened the door to the, the um, open admission eating cups. Big change. Alumni, um, some alumni went ballistic with it. He brought in minorities as the faculty, brought in minorities as students. And he, he oversaw um, Princeton's uh, change to co-education. So there's three big things right there. Um, and then Holly, here's the, the, that picture is a little unflattering for Holly. I have to show the full context. That was Holly at his, at his, his 30th college reunion in 1969. Um, and he's there with his wife, Jen Bell, his five-year-old daughter, Alexandra. And Holly, here he is at the, walking around in his Princeton Charlie uh, orange and black outfit. Um, but Holly, once he's back in New York where he's living, he's working away on a thing called the Plan for New York City. And this is one of the most progressive and unconventional master plans you could imagine. Um, and I'm about to show two clips from this video. Um, the, the video that accompanied the written plan was produced by the Planning Commission of New York. Um, and you'll see that even the planners were caught up in the uh, 1960s political fervor. Um, and the people you see in the, in the opening scene, I should point out, are real people. They are not actors. And um, I can only ask you to imagine any, um, any city planning department today uh, confronting the challenges of their city. So head on. Let's see if this would play. <laughs> Million people pour into Manhattan below 60th Street. That's like transporting the combined populations of Baltimore, Boston, and Cincinnati. They come by bus, car, foot, bike, air, subway, and motor scooter. They work in advertising agencies, corporate offices, clothing factories, and department stores. They come because this is where it's all going on. This is the National Center. So this this video is called "What Is the City But the People." And, uh... Imagine if you were a PR guy and your, your client was the Planning Commission of New York and you saw that, you say, well, guys, this isn't putting the city in a very good light. I hope you guys come in later in this video and, uh, and show that you're part of the solution, that you guys can really come in and turn this thing around. So I'm going to show you this brief clip as well. Two people in the clip that, that are from the Planning Commission. One is Don Elliott, the chairman of the Planning Commission at the time, the guy who was paying the money for this video. Um, and the other is Jack Robertson, who was a Rhodes Scholar from Yale and was a hotshot young architect at the time, and then went on to have a very you know, esteemed career uh, as an architect. So uh, watch them, watch their body language in particular, and then right at the end, you'll hear a little takeaway from doing what's right. Let's see if I can. Hmm. total project of 3,000 and some units, uh, of which 1,000 would be low income, 1,600 would be moderate income, say $35 per room, and the remaining 400 would be middle income. I feel that we're being neglected in terms of we're being uh, more and more commercialized and not having the residential part of the community preserved in any way. Commercialism will come in and wipe us out. 
the question on all of our minds is when is something going to happen? Uh, we don't move as fast as private people. I wish we did. Uh, we better go through this elaborate procedure and, and you know, on a long run, I think it's going to work. When you took the uh, 50th Street site for a school, was it five years ago? Yeah. And you just go get all those tents, and we've even had to come and beg to you, make it at least a playground for a while until you do something with it. I'm living there for 16 years now. What will I do? I, I can't get into project. can't see so good with my eyes. And I have to get out because I have to use four keys to go in. One key outside, one key in the rest of you, one key for downstairs where I am, and one key to my own door. I can't do that. I can't even go. Uh, I can't even go home when it's dark. That's why I don't even go out. I want to go out and I want to get out of there the worst way, and I can't seem to get anything. I don't know what to do. What is the matter? I mean, no, the city really has to start to think in terms of people. They, they really do. You know, that number of people without a place to live, a decent place to live. Is wow. it any wonder that our city is in the condition it's in? Right, and that is not Effective planning means listening. Experts are full of ideas. Residents sometimes come up with better ones. So there was the takeaway right there. And uh, I think that those words may still ring true today. Um, so this, by now we're on the other side of the white horn. He's, he's looking at those public spaces, he's looking now at the physical spaces around him. He's noticed a grave injustice as he was working on this master plan. Um, there had been a zoning change in which the city was giving away to developers. Um, if, they would, if they would create a public plaza at the base of their building, they could get a certain percentage of extra building, extra floors added to the top of their building. This is the most lucrative space in New York that we're talking about. And um, they give away a little public space and it's supposed to be open to the public and uh, they get all this, uh, this extra uh, money in return. So how he looks at it and he says, boy, the public plazas don't do much for the public. In fact, most of them don't do anything. He discovered some were blocked off, chained off, or just abandoned. Um, there, was, there was no reason for anybody to use this space. So he said, basically, the experts have got it all wrong. I want to go in and I want to change this. Um, so what does he do? An organization man, of course. Uh, he goes back to the planning commission and they say, if you can come up with documentation, you can show what will work. Um, we'll, we'll work with you and we'll change that zoning code. So how he sets out to do that. And by 1975, he's come up with, New York has changed the zoning code. All sorts of, um, regulations now governing public spaces in New York. Um, and examples of that are still present in Manhattan today. You can see uh, signs that proclaim this is an open space. It's got so many chairs, it's got so many tables, it's got this, that, and other thing. You can go around and if it doesn't meet those requirements, there's even a website where you go to the plan. Um, and also, so he produced a book by 1980 and a film to go with it. And the book, um, is this book, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. Um, it's known as the Little Red Book in Lanner's circles. And it's been it was reprinted 16 times when I got hold of uh, my copy. Uh, it just came out, another, another edition was just published and it's been, uh, the rights have been sold to, uh, to the Chinese. Um, with it came a video, the same, Thing. This is a very popular video. It's used over and over again in college classes. And um, people go on to YouTube to try to get it. And they will always find, they will, might find it a couple of times, pirate it, go back a week later, and it's not there. So I've got a couple of uh, video clips that I want to show you because this shows the heart of White's thinking in terms of uh, urban design and public spaces. This is the opening, and we start out at Seagram's Plaza in New York. And if I can let it rip, I will. <laughs> this is the plaza of the Seagram building in New York. Late morning. 
For the time-lapse camera, we were testing a hypothesis. The sun, we were pretty sure, would be the chief factor in determining where people would sit or not sit. Now, just after 12, they begin to sit. Right where the sun is. I was enormously pleased. What a perfectly splendid correlation. It was quite misleading, as we would see later, but it was a very encouraging way to start. We were studying the Cedarin Plaza because it was one of the most popular. Many people didn't think that it would be, but it was, and we wanted to find out why. Our research group, the Streetlight Project, has been observing other kinds of city spaces. One was a block of 101st Street in East Harlem. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but almost every factor that later we were to find was important for a city space, we couldn't have found out right here. The clues were right under our nose. <coughs> Now the next little clip is going to have 10 or 15 seconds in the middle of white showing chart after chart after chart. I'm, I'm going to keep it in there though and it demonstrates something that white does that the rest of us don't do often enough, which is it shows his work. We come to the question, why do some plazas work and others not? We rank 15 plazas by the average number of people sitting. They're running somewhere from around 170 down to about oh, a handful, 20 or 30. Now, most of these plazas are comparable in size. Why then the difference? Was it the amount of open space? No, if anything, there was a reverse correlation. What about sitable space? And here we get a bit closer. And had we ranked these at, in terms of quality of the city, we would have a much clearer relationship. We'll check many other things. Elevation, male-female ratio, species, and so on and so on. Charts and stupefying succession. But as we put them all together, one major finding began to shine through. And I'll now share it with you. <laughs> This might not strike you as an intellectual bombshell, but this simple lesson is one that very few cities have ever heeded. They're tough places to sit in. Okay. Now, um, Ken mentioned Ingrid, Ingrid Reed's name uh, in her introduction. And, and Ingrid, um, her husband, Marvin Reed, called as the mayor of Princeton, when Heinz Plaza first came B, um, they didn't want to put movable chairs in the Heinz Plaza. Um, Marvin Reed insisted on it. He said, we've got to have movable chairs. And um, thank, thank Marvin for doing it, because how many times did we use those movable chairs during the COVID? Somebody comes up and they don't want to wear a mask, they come sliding our chair back. Wonderful device. So uh, I have a feeling that Marvin may have seen uh, this movie. We come to that wonderful invention, the movable chair. It's one of the reasons you have such a feeling of choice in places like Paley or Greenacre. You are doing the deciding. It's very interesting to watch how people manipulate chairs. Here you can sort of tell there's going to be a rather aggressive move. Now, whatever the purpose of all this rearranging, it does make for a rather pleasant social ritual. And you'll see many variants of it, often quite lengthy. Even when there's no apparent functional reason of any kind, people move chairs. Watch this girl. Now she's not more than sun than she was before. Fixed individual seats don't work very well. For lovers, uh, love seats are all right. The distances are quite comfortable, but not for most people. Furthermore, chairs like this are telling you you sit here and you sit there. Okay, and the final clip, thanks for bearing with me on this. The final clip, this is on public social places, social life of small urban spaces. It ends up at a very interesting place, as he points out, the street. 
only after we've been studied many other places did I realize we could have learned all of the lessons right here on 101st Street. It's an excellently scaled block, a comfortably sized space, very nice and enclosed, lots of people, and food, food. Very social activity, too. Water? Yes. And you can touch it, you can aim it, you can slosh around it. City, best kind of space, slightly elevated. The lot at the corner is used for games, but the street itself is the number one area for recreation, including that very popular form of polishing of the car. This block has its problems, but it works as a place. Here we are, back at Seabrook. A group of music students are giving a little impromptu concert. Some executives are still confined. It's a very nice time, just before 2 o'clock, everybody's about ready to close up. So we end our film on plazas, not on the plaza, but on the street itself. And that's where we should. The street is the river of life for the city. We come to these places not to escape, but to partake of it. Okay. So the elements of a successful public space, among others, city space, of course, sun, trees, water, food, and the street. Don't forget the street. Um, so uh, let's go to my near the end here. Um, I put this little set of film clips together from Holly's uh, video. And I think about the street. And I think of this space. I walked by it a hundred times. And the Angeles was this wonderful little oasis during the, uh, especially at the beginning of COVID. And a lot of other places shut down. The Angeles stayed open. I don't know if you would call that, but stayed open. You went to get coffee, you could go out. And these little chairs, these little, little tables um, along, along Spring Street there, not much space, but you kind of squeezed in, but you're outdoors, you weren't um, in a dangerous indoor setting. Um, wouldn't it have been nice if there were more of those tables? Um, and I thought about that, and I wondered why not. And then I thought, instead of doing some walking around, Holly says, get out and walk. I walked around the back, and there's this. This plaza, this, this space, of course, it looks like it belongs to the people in the apartments. You know, it's got to be theirs. There's no sign that says you can come in. But that's not quite true. It's actually, uh, it actually is a public open space. And, um, well, okay, I looked a little more closely at it. Um, well, there's some problems. You have to walk down a set of steps to get to it. Big, heavy chairs, little wooden chairs are movable, but not easily movable. The picnic table in the back has fixed fixed seats. And the, and the fixed seats are, uh, and, the, and the fixed seats are, uh, are really bad news. One fellow sitting there uh, pretty much takes up the whole, the whole table. If you were to walk in and kind of join him at that table, you still have to introduce yourself. You're really intruding on his public space. So and then, of course, there's a sign that I discovered. And, there, and uh, no horse spot. I know somebody needed to hear that. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen that one since uh, I think uh, 10th grade in you know, the state of New York. No horse play. So, so, anyhow, the plaza closes at dusk. And it gives you a clue that maybe it's open before dusk. It doesn't say. So this is one of our public spaces, and maybe we didn't do such a great job. I wondered if, they, if at the original planning, if that whole uh, layout had been reversed, and that that open space that we, that we see right here, I wonder if that couldn't have faced Spring Street. And then you'd, have, you'd be next to the street, and you know the street is a critical part of a public, public place, and you would have had all that great 
traffic going by would have been a wonderful little mini Heinz Plaza. But, uh, but live and learn, and as Holly has said, it is difficult to design a space that I'm not attracted to. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so the takeaways for us, what can we do? Um, what, what, are, what are the lessons of all this? Um, Challenges for public spaces are just um, over the top right now. The infrastructure is, uh, social infrastructure is challenged. Um, how can we bring about change? Um, White had some ideas that he first articulated uh, back in 1953. And then um, Bob Goheen on the right shared them with uh, the fellow on the left and his other uh, incoming freshman at Princeton in 1965. And in a nutshell, this is what though he told the incoming class of students at Princeton to think about back in 1965. Every great change has come about and always will because someone was frustrated by the status quo. Someone exercised the skepticism, the question, the kind of curiosity, which to borrow a phrase, blows the lid off everything. I don't think he meant that literally back in 1965. I think some of us may have construed the advice uh, later in the 60s, but, uh, but that was it. They were fighting complacency then, and I think we need to fight complacency now. So um, what I tell myself, and I'll share with you, take, it, take from it what we will, um, exercise our skepticism, our, our question, our curiosity, and do the work. Sometimes you have to get out and, and, and walk, and when you've done that work, um, I'm thinking back to that video about the sitting space, show your work. Don't just announce to the world that you have a better way to go. Show them how you got there. I think that makes a huge difference. And finally, and this one may seem a little odd, um, don't think big. You know? Big plans fall under their own weight. Um, in the book, uh, in the afterward, I have an example from Trenton. Um, more recently, I point to these three fabulous, incredible, Ambitious plans from New Jersey Transit for alternatives to the uh, to the dinky shuttle train between here and Princeton Junction. Will any of that ever happen? I don't know. Um, as White wrote in 1958, he said, "Little plans, lots of them, are just what are needed." And so, let me suggest: don't think big, think small. And on that note, and with that piece of unconventional wisdom from the American Urbans. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming and invite your questions, curiosity, skepticism. You're on. Great job. Thank you so much. Uh, I can say that in the chat, we have lots of people asking us to send their personal regards and Hooray and applause and thank you. Uh, does anybody in the audience say yes, we do? Come on, yes. Rich, yes. would you be kind enough to read an excerpt from the book, a small piece? Well, you know, I think it might like take small? up a lot of time and, and exclude questions. I, I'd rather. But I want to hear your voice. Just a couple paragraphs. Come on, you've been so complimentary of William White and everybody. Like a few paragraphs, just to hear your voice. Okay, oh. please. Um, That's well, a why don't we take it while I'm looking for something? Why don't we take a question? Okay. Early on, um, Rich, you mentioned um, that some material was uh, rather inaccessible and difficult to obtain. I wonder if you could touch a bit up on, um, you know, given your curiosity, how you were able to locate some issues, some uh, material that, in fact, was not so readily available. Just an example, please. Sure. <clears throat> now, the COVID, um, the COVID era really uh, put a cramp on a lot of people's uh, research efforts for many different books. Um, I went up to the Rockefeller Archives in Terrytown and uh, um, walked up there and, and uh, Mel Whiting, my partner, came with me and we spent a day up there and 
And I walked out saying, wow, this is an amazing trove of information. This is day one. I'll have to come back here at least two more days. Just be really intense and look at more stuff. Um, COVID came, the Rockefeller archives shut down. Uh, and and to, the, to the great credit of the Rockefeller people, um, an arch archivist up there named Marianne Quinn um, you know, invited me to, to approach her and she would get into the building once or twice uh, a week. And, and I gave her sort of some areas that I was looking for. She would look to see what she could find. And she also found some stuff and she just said, hey, look at this too. I think you'll be interested in it. So, so the human touch was still uh, very important. And uh, that was the kind of thing that I had to deal with. I have, I have two questions from the online audience. My phone would stay on. Okay, uh, Scott McVeigh asks, why not talk about the project for public spaces, one of White's main legacies? Yeah, the, when, I, when I said that, uh, uh, that White had redone that zoning code in 1975, uh, that was also the year that the thing called the Streetlight Project, which White referenced in the, in the movie. The Streetlight Life Project got transformed into the Project for Public Spaces. And the Project for Public Spaces was formed, I think it was 1975. It is still going pretty well today. It's like every other nonprofit, it's had its challenges in recent times. But it's still doing placemaking. It's still active. Um, a gentleman named Nate Storing, um, is one of the top people of Project for Public Spaces. And he lives about uh, a five minute walk away from here. So we could bring him in if we had to. Okay. Thank you. And Barbara Preston asks, where I grew up, if chairs were not nailed down, they were stolen. I wonder if that's a problem in Princeton. Well, um, according, to, according to Ingrid Reed, um, Marvin, set up, Marvin Reed set up a fund at Burrow Hall to, in order to convince the people at the library to have, to have movable chairs. And he said, well, as they're stolen, this fund will replace them. As far as Ingrid knew, they never had to tap into the fund. The same complaint was made by Princeton University. Um, and, and Holly and Lawrence Rockefeller, who had a little bit of money as, a, as an alumnus of Princeton, um, would come down to Princeton and, and, and give advice to the uh, uh, to the grounds and buildings people, the art and landscape architects at Princeton. And they always argued on behalf of movable chairs. The university was convinced that they would all get stolen. I think really um, they'd be taken as, as souvenirs for dormitory rooms uh, rather than stolen. But there, there, was, there was that problem. Paley Park in New York. Anybody ever been to Paley Park? Wonderful park in New York. Um, never has a problem. They've got all movable chairs, never a problem. Bryant Park has over a thousand movable chairs um, and, and a very distinctive chair at that. Um, and, and those chairs are, are there day and night uh, throughout, the, throughout the season. So it can be a problem. The soapbox. Mm -hmm. so, Rich, I've got a procedural question for you. If you want to write a work of nonfiction, how do you get it from the ideas to an actual physical manuscript that you can actually give to someone? How does that happen? Well, I, I, I started working away on it with no agent and with no, uh, no publisher. Um, so I, I sort of, I had some ideas for some chapters. I, I began to, uh, I, I, had a, I had an outline and I think it became sort of like Holly's little plans. I just made, made plans and lots of them and changed them all the way. But, um, I, I, had, um, I had an outline and then I started working. I, I originally thought that there'd be one chapter on the 1950s. There ended up being four chapters in the book on the 1950s. And um, I, just, I just sort of let the material, as I gathered more material, as I wrote it up, and as it began to make more sense to me and make less sense to me, I just let the plan change. And I, I think I, I had four, I think I had four, an introduction and three or four chapters pretty well coherent. And, I, and that's what I sent to finally get um, a book publisher. That was my process. But, you know, how do you handle all the other things in your life? <laughs> 
Well, it, you know, it took it took a while, and that's in part because I had a I had a day job when I started this whole thing, and so I didn't uh, I didn't work on it. I wasn't as dedicated to the process um, as I should have been, and I and of course. Um, <laughs> uh, we got somebody in the background uh, who, who who was able to uh, who didn't kill me as I as I spent uh, hour after hour, hour after hour with, with Holly White. Um, when you write a biography, it's like it's like a, it's like a college uh, an old college roommate comes back uh, that you loved and it's great times and comes in and says, "I'll just stay if you don't mind. I'll stay for a week or two. and then he ends up spending the whole summer. And, and then and then he ends up spending the whole year, and you think, when's this guy gonna leave? Gonna get rid of him? And uh, so you, you kind of have to weather that storm. But it, so it did take it take it took a while, but ultimately, um, I, I I just slammed away chapter after chapter, um, try to get to the end, and then and then go back and rewrite earlier chapters. That's good. Do we have any more questions? Okay, Thank you so much for this fabulous talk. Um, as far as urban development and White's philosophy, uh, if he was here now, what would he say about Princeton and Princeton University relationship with the town? What, what initiatives might he suggest for the future of this area? Well, I, I think that uh, he would say that a little, a little tension between Princeton University and Princeton the town uh, is not a bad thing. That's a good thing. That, that's good. And uh, when, when, uh, when, when the university butts up against the, uh, the public realm, such as on Prospect Avenue, a um, little tension is going to bring, bring about a better result. And, and, and so that's good. Uh, I think for Princeton Town, I think he would say um, things that work in the urban in the urban realm also work in small towns, and the scale is different. Don't expect to get mass transit here right away. You don't have the density, but boy, you sure can make good use of those public spaces. And he would be thrilled to see Heinz Plaza. He'd be thrilled to see Dome Alley. Um, another little alley is taking shape um, right now. Uh, Started between the Van Diemender and behind Triumph Brewing Company. There's a little walkway that's going to come through, and that's going to connect all the way over eventually to Chambers Street. And if you go back in the other way, if you're a pedestrian, you can walk all the way over to Moran Avenue. You never once go on Nassau Street or Park Place or any of those um, thoroughfares for cars. So he'd be, he'd be very excited about that. Thank you all so much for coming for this very special day, the very first day of publications and publication of such a wonderful review. And uh, Richard, thank you so much for such an amazing presentation, all your hard work. We have so much love for you in the chat. Um, people is wanting to send personal regards and congratulations for a thoughtful and thought-provoking presentation. If we could all just uh, have another round of applause.